This is a revision video about the GCSE chemistry topic of novel materials, ceramics, polymers and composites. This comes up in paper two of AQA GCSE chemistry and it's part of unit 10, the using resources unit. In this video we're going to describe the makeup of ceramics, polymers and composites, give some examples of materials made out of them, describe how different ceramics are made and describe how the properties of polymers can be varied. Ceramics are non-metallic solids, usually made from a raw material that needs heating to a very high temperature. There are two types of ceramic that you need to know about for GCSE chemistry, clay ceramics like pottery and glass. The key difference between these is that clay ceramics, which are made in a furnace from clay, are opaque, whereas glass ceramics are transparent, and this will affect the different things that they're used for. Both of them are hard and waterproof, but also brittle, and so they shatter easily if you drop them. You could be asked about the uses of ceramics and what properties they have that makes them appropriate for that use. For instance, we use clay ceramics for bathroom tiles because they're waterproof, and it doesn't really matter that they're fragile and brittle because they're anchored to the wall. Glass ceramics can be split into two types. There's soda lime glass, which is used for everyday uses like making windows and tumblers for drinking out of, and it's made from sand, sodium carbonate, that's the soda, and limestone, that's the lime. But it doesn't have a very high melting point, and therefore that can be problematic if you want to use it for something that is going to reach a very high temperature. For lab use, and also for some other heat sensitive uses like in the kitchen, you want hard glass or borosilicate glass, and that's made from sand, that's the silica part of the name, and boron trioxide, which is the boro part of the name. The next group of materials that we need to talk about are polymers, and you've already met these earlier in Unit 2, the Structure and Bonding Unit, and also Unit 7, the Organic Chemistry Unit, but here we're going to add a bit more detail. First though, let's have a recap. At least for the purposes of GCSE, a polymer is a very long chain of repeating units called monomers, and that word very is essential if you want to get the mark for the definition in the exam. These monomers aren't individual atoms, they're actually small covalent molecules that have then formed more covalent bonds between them to make these very long chains. So within one chain of polymer there are strong covalent bonds, and then between two chains there are weak intermolecular forces. These are the same weak intermolecular forces that you would see between two ammonia molecules or two oxygen molecules or two chlorine molecules, but actually polymers tend to be solids at room temperature. And the reason for this is that these molecules are much, much bigger than ammonia or oxygen or chlorine. They're often thousands of atoms long. And so even though the intermolecular forces are still comparatively weak, they're much weaker than a strong covalent bond is, because it's such a big molecule, it has a comparatively bigger force. And so it takes more energy to overcome and therefore they're solids at room temperature. We can name these polymers based on the monomer that they're made from. So if I take a thousand ethene molecules, I could make polyethene. And if I take a thousand propene molecules, I could make polypropene. And if I take a thousand styrene molecules, even though we don't call it that anymore, I could make polystyrene. And you get the general idea. In unit seven, you met the idea of addition and condensation polymers. So just to quickly remind you, an addition polymer is made from monomers that have a double bond in the middle. And that double bond is going to break allowing each one of the carbon atoms to form a new bond and therefore it can bond to a monomer on either side and we're going to get a very long chain. Whereas in condensation polymerization we need two different functional groups. So this could either be two different monomers that need to mix together or it could be one monomer that has a different functional group on each end. Like these amino acids here, they have an amine on one end and a carboxylic acid group on the other end and um, the condensation polymerization will involve the loss of a small molecule like water and new bonds forming. Also in unit seven, you learn a range of examples of polymers, including DNA with a double helix structure made of four complementary nucleotides, proteins made of amino acids shown here on the right by the amino acid glycine and starch, which is made out of the monomer glucose. Here's where the new content for unit 10 starts. Polymers can have different properties like different melting points or flexibilities or densities or tensile strengths. And those properties will differ based firstly on the monomer that they're made out of. So polyethene and polypropene obviously don't have the exact same properties because they're fundamentally different substances. But the properties of the polymer will also depend on the reaction conditions when it was made. So that means the temperature and the pressure and the catalyst used. Let's look at an example. Polyethene is a really common, really useful plastic, and there are two main types, low density polyethene or LDPE and high density polyethene or HDPE. 
Low density polyethene is made under incredibly high pressure and pretty high temperature too, with a tiny bit of oxygen in there to function as a catalyst. When the polymer forms, it makes branches, and those branches stop the chains from packing too closely together. In contrast to that, high density polyethene is made under relatively low pressure, maybe only 10 atmospheres as compared to 1000, and a slightly lower temperature, probably about 100 degrees C, with a kind of catalyst called a ziegler natter catalyst. When it forms, the polymer chains get into these really regular rows that pack tightly together, and so the final polymer is much harder and much denser. Now, completely separately from that, you need to know about thermosetting and thermosoftening polymers. And I really want to emphasize that this is a completely different part of the specification. Lots of the time people end up getting confused and thinking that the crosslinks in thermosetting polymers are the same thing as the branches in LDPE, and they're not. So thermosetting polymers, if we look at them on a molecular level, kind of look like a wonky brick wall. They have crosslinks between the chains, and these crosslinks are just covalent bonds. Those covalent bonds will stop the chains from moving past each other. This is exactly the same idea as if you think back to unit two and diamond and the fact that diamond is really hard because all of the atoms have got four strong covalent bonds and so they can't move at all. So here our chains can't move past each other. And so that means that if you heat them, they don't melt, they just stay strong until eventually they burn and char. In contrast to that, thermosoftening polymers don't have crosslinks. And so they just melt, which obviously means they're no good for functions like insulating something that will get very hot like kitchenware, because even a small amount of thermal energy is enough to overcome the weak intermolecular forces between layers. It's also worth pointing out here that if you do a design and tech subject, they use some different words for thermosoftening polymers like thermoforming, and those aren't credit worthy in a science exam. You need to use the word thermosoftening. Finally, you need to know about composites. A composite material is made by combining two or more raw materials, but we're not talking about mixing them up until they blend into each other. There are quite large pieces of each part and you can still tell them apart, they're still distinct. This use of two materials often allows composites to have a useful combination of properties, like being very strong and lightweight. The two materials that make up a composite are called the reinforcement and the matrix, or it's sometimes called a binder. The reinforcement is often the one that's providing the main strength while the matrix will be sticking it together. So it might be the case that if we made the entire object out of the reinforcement material, then it will be strong, but just too heavy. Or it could be that actually the matrix is giving properties of its own, like making it waterproof. There are both natural and synthetic examples of composite materials. So to take a natural example, wood contains the same soft cellulose that's found in all plant cell walls, but it's combined with a harder substance called lignin. These lignin fibres form the reinforcement and they are surrounded by the cellulose matrix. For a synthetic example, we can look at steel reinforced concrete. Now, technically speaking, concrete is itself actually a composite because it's made from cement and sand and aggregate or small stones. Concrete has really good compressive strength, which means it resists being squashed. But if you try to bend it at all, it can sometimes shatter. It's quite sort of fragile and brittle. The steel reinforcement has really good tensile strength, which means it can be stretched or it can be bent and it's able to resist that. So steel reinforced concrete is even stronger and even better than just regular concrete because it will resist both being squashed and being stretched. Another example might be plywood, which is made from very thin layers of wood held together with glue. So the plywood is the reinforcement, it's providing the main structure and strength, and then the glue is the matrix or the binder, and it's holding the whole thing together and also making it lighter than it would be if we were using pure wood. Let's finish off now with some questions, starting with ceramics. So you know the drill by now, pause the video and write down some answers. Okay, so fractional distillation, as we hopefully know if you've already studied Unit 7, involves a really, really high temperature. So for this instance, we're going to want borosilicate glass because it has a much higher melting point than soda lime glass, and so it's not going to melt in the middle of my demonstration. Now, everyone watching my demonstration wants to be able to see what's happening, so clay ceramic would be no good because clay ceramics are opaque. And now for some polymers. Can you define what's meant by a polymer, describe how you know that the top picture is a thermosetting polymer, and explain why the bottom picture would be no good for making saucepan handles out of? So a polymer is a very long chain of repeating units called monomers. The top picture is a thermosetting polymer because there are crosslinks between the layers, and the bottom polymer would be no good because it is a thermosoftening polymer, and I can tell because it doesn't have any crosslinks, so it would melt when it was heated. 
Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this video useful. If you did then don't forget to like and also press the subscribe button down below.